I trust you have all fallen in love with the practice over these last few days. Perhaps at times you have hated it as well, but you have continued on to see where it really comes from and where it really goes to. To give all in our practice, to give all to our practice. I trust you have gotten a good sense of what this really is. It is a most natural letting go, letting go of the confusions, the delusions, the entanglements, letting go of everything in a very good way. This includes letting go of our intellectual understanding, letting go of our so-called knowledge, letting go of the things that we hold most dear. Yes, it is very common in spiritual practice, not just in Zen, but in genuine spiritual practice to come to a point where we don't know anymore. If it sounds somehow strange to you, look at the great mystic mountain of your own tradition, Meister Eckhart. Meister Eckhart is just as clear as the Zen masters about this point of having to let go of everything that we hold dear to ourselves. Hmm? To let go of our knowing, of course, to let go of our having, our possessing, to let go of our very being. Hmm? It is unmistakable in Meister Eckhart, just as it is unmistakable in Zen, and I trust in any genuine spiritual tradition. It's necessary because unless we can let go of our self-made, huh? world, our self-centered delusions, we cannot see what is in front of us. We cannot see reality. We cannot see what is. We only see it through the narrow lens of our self. Oh, we see something, but more importantly, we blind ourselves to what is really here. I trust you all know this from your own experience. Let me put it in a more approachable, understandable way, if you like. 
There's a wonderful story from a couple of hundred years ago in the United States. Uh, it's called the Arkansas Traveler. If you're interested, I talk about it at the end of a uh, chapter in the book translated into German. Huh? Uh, no self in Zen Buddhism. But here, let us change the characters around a bit. We have been speaking of the legend of the sixth patriarch. Since it is a legend, allow me to freely add on a bit. When this uneducated young man from the south of China, who became the sixth patriarch. In Japanese, his name is pronounced Eno, or Dokuso Eno, Dokuso, the sixth patriarch Eno. When he was just a child, he would go and gather firewood and sell it in the town nearby. His father had recently died. He was still a pretty young boy. But in order to support his mother, this is very important in any culture, but very important in Chinese culture. To support his mother, he collected the firewood and he sold it in the town. As you may remember, he was going to deliver firewood to a house when he happened to hear the Diamond Sutra being chanted and he had that first insight, mind arises without abiding. But this is before that, before that. Well, as it turns out, according to my legend, a man in his young 20s the man who was going to become the head monk at the Fifth Patriarch's Monastery. The one who was going to write on the wall constantly, continually polish that mirror, let not any dust collect. He was on his way to the Fifth Patriarch's Monastery to begin his practice. Many years later, he would become the head monk. On his way, he got lost in the mountains, completely lost his way. And he happened to come upon this young kid carrying wood on his back. And he said, excuse me, Young man, can you help me? I'm a bit lost. I'm looking for the great monastery of the fifth patriarch. It's in such and such a town. Please tell me, how can I get there from here? The very young Eno, the guy who becomes the sixth patriarch, puts the wood down on the ground, rubs his chin a little bit, looks up the road, looks down the road, then looks the man in his face and says, you can't get there from here. You can't get there from here. Well, the Buddhist monk, who's going to become the head monk, <laughs> thinks this is just a stupid little kid who doesn't know anything. You can't get there from here. There must be some way. Maybe I have to go back a little bit and around, but there must be some way I need to go from here to there. 
but this guy, this little kid is stupid. Let me try again. Listen, kid, can you at least tell me where this road goes to? Again, the little boy, uneducated, Eno, rubs his chin again, looks up the road. Sir, this road don't go nowhere doesn't go anywhere. Every morning I get up and it's just sitting there. <laughs> so finally, this young monk who is going to become the head monk loses it, loses his temper. And he says, you must be the stupidest little kid I've ever met. The young Eno says, maybe so, sir, but I'm not lost. This was originally a story from Arkansas, which was considered 200 years ago, the backwoods, kind of like where the Sixth Patriarch came from in far southern China. Uncivilized, uneducated people lived there. But of course, in this story, the one who doesn't know, but is not seeking, in a sense, he knows what is really needed. <laughs> He is not lost. The head monk is in a hurry. Hurry up, tell me, how can I get there? Does this sometimes sound similar to people asking about the Zen path? <laughs> tell me how to do it as quickly and easily, maybe even as cheaply as possible. <laughs> All the while remaining stuck hmm, to their little self-centered views and thus they're in a hurry to get nowhere. Zen never tires of trying to point out, do you see, really see where you are right now? If you did, you wouldn't run around seeking. It's because you don't fully see where you are right now. What is underfoot, under your own feet, that you go seeking afar. Huh? The wonderful image of classic Chinese Zen. Why do you ignore the precious family jewels, the gem in your own home, in your own hand, and go chasing for it somewhere else? You must realize hmm, the one who is seeking right here and right now. In effect, the one who is seeking, when that one comes to rest, stops and sees what is there. The practice is done. I trust you can see for the sixth patriarch, the man who was going to become the sixth patriarch, to say from the first, right here and right now, really, there is not one thing, is not simply a criticism of 
the head monk's poem about constantly practicing. No. Originally, really, there is not one thing. This is where we must practice from. And this is where we practice too. And this is how we practice. Hmm? Nothingness polishes itself. Being without self, we polish the empty sky. <laughs> This is none other than great compassion. Hmm? Do we do it for ourselves? Do we do it for others? <laughs> you chant, don't you? Every day in retreat. Numberless beings set free. This is not an empty promise. It is where we begin. It is the path we take and it is where we are going. Numberless beings set free. During this week, you have come to it, haven't you? What this concentration is, how you have had to come back again and again, how tedious, how frustrating, how tiring it can be, yes. But when you are doing it correctly, when you just give yourself to it without any thought of success or failure, not even better or worse, but just the concentration that you are so hard seeking, so desperately trying to gather and develop. Hmm? Yes, and that's all good and well. Yes, by all means, return again and again. But if you are doing it correctly, it becomes clear. What you have been seeking that concentration is always already here. Complete, total, constant, seamless without a break. And there is where we just continue to dig right in. This is the work of love. This is compassion at work. Continuing to polish empty space, if you like. <laughs> Being without self. Patiently polishing the mirror for others. That concentration, when it reaches its culmination, it is gone without a trace then that concentration is the whole universe. And the whole universe is that concentration. There is no longer an I looking out 
onto the world. How to say it? The world now looks at itself. The world is nothing but this, and this is nothing but the world. Forget all the mystical jargon and language. The separation is gone once and for all. That's what awakening is. You don't gain a thing. You don't need to gain a thing. All you need to do is split from that split, to use the language of my youth, <laughs> to let that separation be gone because it is not real. The separation that keeps you from the other, that keeps you from the world, that keeps you from who you really are. That separation cannot sustain itself, maintain itself, because it is not real. Confirm it in your bones, not just in your head, in your mind. Confirm it in your bones. There is no such thing. That separation is not real. It is null and void. <laughs> Still, when you go out of the zendo, you put on your shoes and not someone else's. <laughs> Good. You don't need a self-identity for that, do you? <laughs> no. Not being anything. Being completely free of self, you put on your shoes, yes, and sit at your place for a meal, yes. To get to the wonderful point where we don't know a thing is a wonderful place, but we cannot remain there either. That not knowing one thing must spring back into life through all the senses, the five senses and the mind, mind arising without abiding. This is the true dignity of human life. This is where compassion comes from. This is where true creativity comes from. Hmm? Confirm it in your bones. As several of the questions yesterday well brought up, huh? the danger of putting up some kind of a goal and trying to get there. Huh? In your practice, have you actually come to the point where rather than trying to get somewhere, you realize you can only come from there. You can't get there from here. You can only come from there. This is not something in your head. Even to say it's in your body. Yes, it's in your body, which is the whole universe.
please feel free to stand up and stretch for a moment. Have you confirmed in your bones that this is not merely a state of mind, a mind state, a state of consciousness? It is not a state of mind. For sure, the self goes into and out of many states of mind every day. But this is not a state of mind. Zen is about our actual experience, but in a radical way. Genuine Zen is not concerned with states of mind, even very deep, very calm, very open. They can be helpful on the way. They can also be traps, places where we abide, get stuck in. Nor is Zen a way of being. Zen is not even stuck in being, a state of being, a way of being. Thus, very clearly, the Six Patriarchs warning, really there is not one thing. There is nothing you need to be. Have you really confirmed that in your bones? There is nothing you need to be. Not being one single thing. Well. You find you are everything. You are inseparable from all. Then, then it makes sense to consider how do I help another? How do I help another who is inseparable from me? No better, no worse. How do I help the other in need. From here, yes, from here. If anyone has a question or concern from out of the practice for the benefit of all, please feel free to raise it now. Thank you for listening so intently.